Tonight, one SNP leadership hopeful casts more doubt on the contest. Ash Regan suggests members demand the chance to change their... With a week until a new leader is chosen, we'll hear from all three campaigns. Also on the programme. And later, the King of Waltz, Andre Ria, live on the sofa. Welcome to the night. Time next week, we will know who will succeed Nicola Sturgeon as First Minister and leader of the Scottish National Party. And if the past few days are anything to go by, both jobs bring their fair share of baggage. The turmoil of the past week inside the SNP began when two of the leadership candidates, Ash Regan and Kate Forbes, cast doubt on the integrity of the contest to succeed Ms Sturgeon. And they questioned whether the party could be trusted to run a fair ballot. At the same time, they, along with another, the other hopeful Hamza Yousaf, demanded the SNP reveal up-to-date membership numbers. Well, when they got their way and the party revealed, it now had just over 72,000 paid members a drop uh, of 30,000 uh, in little over a year, resignations followed. First, the party's head of media, Murray Foote. Then, sensationally, its chief executive, Peter Murrell, Nicola Sturgeon's husband, after the party gave misleading statements to the media about those membership numbers. The SNP's president reckons his party got itself into a tremendous mess. Its current leader, appearing on ITV's Loose Women panel, was asked if she agreed. Ash Regan's feelings about her integrity of the ballot. Track and the country needs governing well. So when but that's not what you asked for. You, you haven't got, as a, a team, what you've asked for. Let me bring in Michelle Thompson. Michelle Thompson, Kate Forbes also questioned the process. Does she believe that these issues that, that she sees surrounding the election process or what has gone on losing the chief executive of the SNP, does she think that this would actually influence the way that members might vote for a candidate. What, what is the thinking here? What does she think is going on? Well, <laughs> what are those things that you feel you have now got, got some certainty on? Move forward. OK, so is Kate Forbes certain about this process tonight? And will she be, even if she does not get this third auditor that has been requested? Let's bring in Alison Thewlis then. What are Hamza Youssef's feelings today, tonight, about this process? questions about the process for, for well over a week now. This process, what would you like to well, say on quite, behalf of Ash Regan's campaign? Yeah, I think it's quite telling that you, uh, this, can, this is only more examples of that. In terms of the mind... That Hamza Youssef has been labelled from day one by many as the continuity candidate has been an issue for him, has been made more difficult. OK, well, stay with us. As important as it is to hear what they will all be doing to sort out internal SNP matters, more people are interested in what they will do as First Minister. And we are going to talk about that after this reminder of how the contest unfolded. To talk about, Hamza Youssef has also lauded his own record in office. That's been questioned by his opponents, but what would you say his record in office gives him? And putting that forward as, as the kind of candidate and the kind of first minister that she would be, some have questioned that as a move to the right, if you like, but, but what do you think that she would offer in terms of yeah. that, that different policy direction on economics? Yeah. Okay, Kurt Connell, Ash Regan, probably the least known of the three candidates to, to the general population. What is we started this campaign with her suggesting that the party has lost its way a little. Uh, information has been forced out of H King that we need to get in and we need to so start solving these problems, be more credible. Jest, she's probably the third candidate. Who would your next preference? Alison Thewlis, let me come back to you and, um, and ask in terms of the, the defining issues, do you think that issues have been forefront enough in this campaign, considering all the, the distractions of, of many of the other issues and arguments that have gone on? Michelle Thompson, we just heard Alison referring to, to green energy, green jobs. <clears throat> what next for the, the coalition with the Greens? Because Kate Forbes has made clear that that relationship would be, would be likely to change. Things though have raised concerns about her views on social issues. To what extent has she, in your view, been able to move away from that first very difficult week for her with the, some of the headlines yeah. that she faced? OK. Kirk, I wonder if you can just give us a sum up of what we might see happen tomorrow. Are we going to hear any more from us? So members actually calling up HQ and demanding some sort of uh, intervention. Well, we're grateful to you for coming in tonight. Thank you very much, Thank Kirk Torrance. Much. And also down the line in Dundee, Michelle Thompson and Alison Thewlis in Westminster. Thank you all.
Russia's President Vladimir Putin says he will discuss China's plan to end the war in Ukraine as President Xi Jinping arrived in the Russian capital for highly anticipated talks. The two leaders called each other dear friends, but it's a friendship that's making some Western leaders anxious. The BBC's Russia editor Steve Rosenberg reports. A major area of concern for watchers of today's meeting between Mr Putin and Mr Xi is Taiwan. That is this island, about 100 miles off the Chinese mainland. Beijing says it's a breakaway province that belongs under Chinese control. But Taiwan considers itself independent with its own constitution and democratically elected leaders. President Xi hasn't ruled out using force to bring Taiwan under Beijing's control. China has the largest army in the world and its air force and navy both dwarf Taiwan's. Well, controlling the island would extend China's military presence in the Pacific and give Beijing control of the world's supply of computer chips. More than two-thirds of the chips in our phones, our cars and our computers are made in Taiwan. Now, there's concern Mr Xi might offer to support Russia's war with Ukraine if Russia backs a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Well, Cindy Yu is the host of The Spectator's Chinese Whispers podcast. I asked her what each leader wanted out of today's talks. Different factors here. Now, all countries should bring their net zero targets forward by a decade. That's the response by UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres to a major new climate report. The Ivergun in, in Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has set out the deadly risks from a warming planet and that a key goal to keep the global temperature below 1.5 degrees Celsius is likely to be missed. Well, the report calls for rapid cuts to fossil fuels in order to achieve that. So how is the UK hoping to tackle the challenge of securing a greener and cheaper supply of energy? Well, here is how the UK generated its electricity in 2022. Fossil fuels, mainly gas, made up nearly 44%. Nuclear accounted for about 15%. Wind and solar power made up nearly 29%. Meanwhile, for hydropower and bioenergy, it was around 13%. And if you added up all those low carbon sources, they generated 56.2% of the UK's electricity. In terms of the future, the UK government says that by 2030, they want that to be 95%. And by 2035, all of it. We'll hear in a moment whether those... Well, as you heard, there are calls for more urgent action to try to stick to those net zero targets. But can drastic changes to the ener energy industry be achieved in such a time frame? Well, can... Still to come in the nine. For the sports team today, thanks thought, very much. I thought, I thought we were meant to be good at, at, at curling. I thought cur curling was the it's thing. one of our it's things. Scotland has, yeah. <laughs> Chris, what do you think about the curling thing? I'm not getting involved. <laughs> <laughs> You're a wise man. Wise man, Chris. Thank you very much. Thanks, Martin. Now, 20 years ago today, the UK became part of a force that invaded Iraq. The US-led coalition toppled Saddam Hussein's regime over a month of combat, but that was only the start of things. Tens of thousands would die over the course of the UK's eight years in Iraq. Well, by the time that Britain left, 179 personnel had lost their lives. The Black Watch was one of the first units to be deployed, and one of their soldiers was Kev Stacey, who ended up serving three tours despite serious injury. He's been telling BBC Scotland his story of the Iraq War. Oh, that was Kev Stacey's story. And mm. of course, so many stories that we're going to mark this week, aren't we? We're going to hear yes. tomorrow from Rosa Sally, who fled uh, Hussein's regime. Yes, and she actually then came to Scotland and set up Glasgow Girls, the original Glasgow Girls. So she'll be telling us about her work, uh, taking on the Home Office, uh, is, is how uh, she phrases it, uh, trying to, I suppose, combat the... So that's tomorrow. Yeah, good tomorrow. to get that story Excellent. tomorrow on the yeah. nine. Right, well, our next guest is the world's biggest male solo touring artist, and he is the modern king of waltz. It is none other. But first, let us just have a, a quick look, Andre, at some of your, your, your highlights from your previous tours. That's all. Okay. Oh, wonderful stuff. Thank you so much for coming in to see us on. It's a lovely pleasure. Hill. The odd man out here, Indeed. I don't match at all. And also the colour of the Scotland flag. So welcome Very to Scotland. I do a little. Yeah, you have a touch of tartan there. Yeah. Will you be dusting off your kilt for your tour coming around? For your Glasgow and Aberdeen. Yeah, in May, I think. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, Looking fantastic. forward to it. To, to play for on the best we, in the world. Oh, you say incredible watching the, the, the clip there that some people might have an idea of classical music being a little bit sort of stiff, a little bit sort of fear there. Yeah, but I tell you, the only music that touches my heart mm. and because the hearts of all the audience. You can really feel that energy. So yeah. is that important to you when you're performing that you've got that rap? So again, before I go on stage, Still it's never together. But you do that, I mean, you have such a mix of, of, of music, beautiful arias and operas, and then you could decision making yeah, process it's, for it's deciding. experience after long years of making. Oh, and fabulous. the last piece is Happy Day, Happy Day. It's called Aria by, by Giuseppe Verdi, oh. Caro Norma, and the whole audience is completely mm -hmm. different. So you're Nobody not does that in the world. No. Yeah, you're not afraid to mix your genres, but also the pace and that, to, to, yes, to uplifting that, to, to more serious, emotional... Exactly. So it's the whole thing together, and that's what makes the people believe that I'm a human. And that's my holiday. Oh, I'm right at, at you must love... 2,000 years ago, at, it's amazing. And so just Glasgow and Rome, just about... No, the never. Country. No, no you're just I'm, here I go on tour because I'm resting, do my sport and concentrate on tour. <laughs> exactly. Well, I, I wonder... I, I've played a little I, bit of violin. I think you even don't well, know me. <laughs> I, I played a bit of violin when I... I wasn't never quite at your level, I would say. But all my pals were playing, like, the electric guitar yeah. and the drums. And that was all... They were very cool instruments, whereas the, the little violin wasn't. Is the violin becoming a bit more popular? Like I hope so. I never saw a violin and then now they... Oh, it's nice. And if we have parents watching tonight who want their children to practice their violin. Little story. Um, I was practicing the sort of beautiful girls on the street and I played. <laughs> Audrey, thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you from the worker room, can't you? Yeah, sure. yeah. Well, look at Judith, thank charming. you very much. Uh, very charming <laughs> indeed. Right. We better, wrap her, we better wrap it up there, I think. Um, that is just about all we have time for on uh, the nine. We will be back tomorrow, though we can't promise Andre Rue, but yeah. we'll do our best. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you for watching. Bye bye. This time next week, we'll know who the new SNP leader and First Minister is. We'll hear from all three campaigns tonight after a tumultuous few days for the party. We'll also ask if the UN chief's assertion that countries should bring forward their net zero plans by a decade are realistic. And the modern king of waltz, Mr Andre Roux, joins us on the sofa. We'll see you at nine.